Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the Traversing the Stars podcast. Today's special guests are Ryan and Kaz Furpo. You know them as the screenwriters of the Eternals movie from Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now join me as we go Traversing the Stars. Hello, uh, uh, Ryan and Kaz Furpo. It's a great pleasure to talk with you. Likewise. Thank Thanks, you. Jeff. It's a pleasure yeah. to be here. Thank you so much. I got to watch the Eternals movie. It is fantastic. Definitely worthy of all the Marvel movies. I want to thank you so much for um, helping to write the screenplay. <laughs> that is that was our pleasure. So how does it feel to be the writers or the co-writers of the number one movie in America two weeks in a row? It was amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, we can't we come from really like the indie film world, and uh, you know, when I decided to be a filmmaker, I really thought that I was just going to be an independent filmmaker, and I was always looking to just make movies completely outside the system. So um, I maybe never had the uh, the guts to dream that big before. So to be here now is just a it's incredible uh, experience, um, and also just mostly to see it connect so well with uh, with young kids because it just makes me think about. When I was, uh, was when I was 12, 13 years mm. old, and when I became really fell in love with movies, and realizing like that this movie is is that for for this new, the newer generation, it's just it's really um, it's such an honor to be a part of that. Mm. So, when you guys went into the process of actually writing the screenplay for the Eternals, how familiar with were you guys with the characters from the comic books? And if you did um, check the source material, which storylines were the most influential for both of you? Yeah, candidly, we were not enormous um, comic fans. We come from, you know, novels and screenplays and features and TV, and there's just so much, so many amazing stories. And when we were first sitting down in that room with, you know, Kevin and Nate and Lou, all the presidents and producers at Marvel, who are the, sort of the brain trust, we hadn't really heard that much about the Eternals. I think like the audiences out there, they're not a tremendously well-known entity, but most importantly, mm -hmm. it was just an exciting sandbox. And to do justice to Jack Kirby's work and to play in that universe and to ask those big questions, that's what really attracted us right away. Um, I think fundamental, we always like to shout out Jim Kruger and Alex Ross, who did the Earth X run. There are some really big, and I don't want to spoil too much, but just gonzo ideas that we, we took from that. And that was a big sort of uncanny Bible for us, as well as just the character work from Neil Gaiman's run. And just, you know, in general, trying to do some justice to the weirdness. And I use that in the highest form of a compliment to the original uh, Jack Kirby 1976 issues. So because like I said, the characters aren't as well known and even um, from big comic book nerds like me, weren't as familiar with the storylines. Is that more freeing because you can pretty much do what you want with them because there's a lot less baggage that goes along with the characters or is it pressure because once again the characters aren't as well known and now you have to make sure they're acceptable and enjoyable to a huge audience who once again we're not as familiar with them i think that it was more freeing than anything and you know we we generate uh we write our own original movies and we're no strangers to basically world building and trying to kind of build original ip and um, and so you know when we with the journals we couldn't have really viewed it like that you know we it was very much it's very much like a silo movie in in terms of the MCU you know it obviously is connected but not as heavily connected as some of the stuff before it um, and then also the fact like you said it was just, these are completely kind of unknown characters from an unknown series so we kind of viewed it as like just this is like a this is a, our own kind of original uh, property basically um, that we get to, that we get to build off of um, so we found that. Um, we, we, we found that very freeing and, and like, and we've said before that, um, you know, any writer who gets the call from Marvel to come in and, and do something for them, it's, it's very exciting. It's, it's, it's basically a feather in the cap for, for anybody. But, um, so, so we would have been happy writing, um, any Marvel movie, but, but this movie in particular is so connected to kind of who we are and the different things that we've explored already in, in our, in our writing that we just, uh, knew right from the jump that this would, this was, this had to be the movie that we, we would we should write now i think one thing i really loved about the eternal movement i really think it was a, a really well done movie and i really appreciate it um it was is that it's very different feeling than a lot of the other marvel movies how did you guys find the right voice for this eternals film yeah i don't think you know there's any one thing a movie is that i think ten thousand people worked on eternals you know they're all bringing their voice and their passion to it but for us you know where it all begins is just 
us sitting in a windowless room imagining what this movie could be. And for us, a big part of that voice is, you know, we're asking really big questions. And I think that that was mm. something that this movie could do. It could make you cry. It could make you laugh. It could make you cheer. And if you can do that, I mean, that's the basic building blocks of cinema. And so we knew we wanted this to be a very ambitious big film that asked big questions, that was challenging, uh, and did something different. And I think those were always our guiding lights. You know, in their very first conversations with Nate Moore and Kevin Feige, it was like, they want this movie to be something, a new chapter, you know? And that was such a gift to be given, to be able to, to have that mandate from above and to try these new things and bring new characters into the universe. Um, so there isn't one way that you do it, but I think it does start with that first conversation, you know, just everyone being in lockstep and saying, yeah, we're trying to make a movie that asks big questions about humanity, about life, about faith, um, mm -hmm. and about purpose. And so that was something that as long as you're tackling those big, big questions, then the movie's going to have to have a language and a vocabulary that lets you do that. Now, I think another thing that I think was um, fantastic about the story, once again, is that once again, it's a very di diverse cast. Um, not only is it a diverse cast, but obviously the characters themselves are a very diverse group of characters. They, in many ways, represent many different groups of, from around the world of, uh, you know, our human world. So how important was it when you were writing it to make sure that it was diverse? You did have so many different voices from so many different groups of people, and, and so many different people had a character that they, they could identify with. Yeah, I mean, this is like you said it yourself, this is a movie that's about humanity and it's sort of like it's baked into the concept that they're supposed to be living amongst us. So it stands to reason that they would represent all the different aspects and different ethnicities and so that they could go in and be part of humanity. So, yeah, we really wanted to make to, to have a cast of characters who represent the entire spectrum of humanity and um, and uh and yeah, and it's and, and kudos to Marvel for for being brave enough to to take those take those risks and um and give a platform to a lot of voices that that we haven't heard from before. Mm. And you know, and, and I think it's also a fantastic thing that you did create is make the characters so diverse and once again speak to so many people. Because what I think something that's very interesting about your story that it has huge scope. I mean, these characters are super powered. They're for um, for all kinds of purposes immortal. How did you find the humanity in these characters? Once again, given that they are once not only super powered, immortal, and how do you make them identifiable to your diverse uh, viewership? Yeah, I mean that's a great question, but you, you almost said it yourself. You know, right away you're looking for the humanity in these characters. You, what do they want? What do they need? And I think you always approach it from that. This is a circus family. You know, it's a large group of diverse people who are not really related, but they've decided to sort of band together for this mission that's larger than themselves. And so right away, you're looking to say like, you know, I think flaws are what really make people who they are, you know, and I think that's an important aspect. And, mm. you know, even Iron Man and Cap, they're, I would say they're most famous for their flaws, you know, that's sort of what makes them who they are. And so that was something that you don't go and say, why is this person broken? But you look at them and say, you know, what makes this person tick, you know, and mm. yes, they might be gods, they might be superheroes, they might be able to fly. But at the end of the day, you're not going to remember, you know, how fast he can fly, you're going to remember, you know, what he stood for and what, what faith meant to them. And so that's a big part of the way we approach character, which is really a, the way we approach the whole the whole movie. So without giving away any spoilers, so once again, um, only two weeks in, so a lot of people um, may not have seen the movie or know the, the spoilers yet. But if you can answer the question without giving away anything, how did the characters change from the original conception uh, conception of the characters to how they appear on screen? And did some and which character do you think had the, evolved the most from how you originally conceived the character to maybe how they appeared? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a tr that's a difficult question, to be quite honest, because the all the characters are actually pretty close to like some of the early drafts. I mean, I think it's already been reported that in the, in the very first draft, there were a dozen characters. So um, so obviously, moving forward, there were only 10. Um, but uh, but they're all like actually pretty, pretty close to the to our original ideas. What was really exciting to see is just the um, the kind of chemistry between uh, Druig and Makari, you know, that was something that we didn't really put uh, in in our drafts, and I think that was something that was actually really born just out of the out of the chemistry between um, Barry and Lauren, and also uh, Chloe being the fantastic director that she is of recognizing that and and accenting it and bringing it out. So that was actually a really nice surprise for us when we saw the first cut of the movie. Is it difficult to balance 
um, developing character with um, the wor world building, especially in a movie. I mean, there's so much scope to the Eternals. I mean, yeah. you're basically dealing with things on a, such a universal scale and not only universal, but a this temporal, almost infinite amount of time scale. Is it hard to balance developing that and like I said, and the world building with developing these characters? And how did you think of balancing them in your script? Oh yeah, I mean, it's absolutely challenging. I mean, if you could write a movie with two characters in one room, it'd be a lot easier. Um, <laughs> but that's sort of the joy of playing in the Marvel sandbox, you know, is to play with these big mythologies. And that's really where we approach this movie. We approached it as a new tale of the old gods. We wanted to be able to like tell you the story and explain where they came from and how they got here and how that tied into this universe. And so, yeah, it's definitely challenging. I mean, that's one of the challenges of writing. I always like to say that screenwriting is like doing a 1000 piece puzzle just in your imagination. Like you're trying to do it in your head and like keep track of the corners and all the patterns and like make sure that it works and looks good. Um, and yeah, you never solve every single part of that puzzle because the puzzle is constantly changing. Um, so yeah, it's definitely challenging, but like I said, it's one of the great pleasures to sort of figure out ways to do that, to explain that, to make people feel it instead of uh, be told it. Mm. So um, yeah, but it's yeah. part of the process is to just get in there and, um, and try to make it work. Yeah, and like, and I'll just add that, like, like figuring out the actual world building and the rules of the world and kind of the plot and the backstory and the mythology, all that stuff is challenging in its own right, but then connecting all that to the characters' journeys, you know, and connecting it to them um making choices uh throughout the movie that's where kind of the real work um is done and, and when you do that that's where you end up kind of you're able to like hide a lot of the um the seams i guess of of what you're building um so uh so yeah it's always a challenge in every movie but yes it, in eternals in particular had, had a massive amount of mythology and and characters to get through you know, and I think one of the best characters in, in the story, I mean, everyone's gonna have their own favorite character. There's so many cool characters, everyone has their favorite. I think one of my favorite characters was Thena. Um, not just because <clears throat> Angelina Jolie does a fantastic job as the character, and, and, she, and she really does. But I think what I liked about Thena is that she is so incredibly flawed in this film. And in many ways, it turns out that that flaw becomes kind of a strength in how, in what she seems like giving anything away, and in, in what she sees and what she knows because of that flaw. Is there, was there an intentional message in creating that aspect of her character that the, in many ways her flaw in many ways is her strongest as, um, character or aspect? Yeah, I mean, just speaking to Angelina specifically, you know, she really came on to the project really early on and we were really excited by that because we knew that Thena had to possess both this incredible fearless strength and this kind of this fragility, you know, um, and, and, and and nobody can really do that better than Angelina, you know, like we often kind of joked that it was sort of like Laura Croft meets her character from Girl Interrupted, uh, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, so anyway, um, but yeah, uh, in terms of the, the messaging, I think it just has to do, you know, a lot, the Eternals are not human, but the qualities that they possess and the qualities that ultimately lead them to victory and to unity are uh speak to the um the power of the human spirit you know and and so so that is so we're seeing that as a microcosm in Thena's character is the ability to overcome this adversity and these obstacles within yourself enables you to overcome these obstacles externally uh within the world you know i really like that because i think you know we're talking about um, being able to identify with characters that you see in the movie. And I think there's a lot of people too who deal with their own psychological issues, mental issues. And I think that's a great thing that you you kind of offered a character that they could look to as well and saying, look what she's able to accomplish given what she's dealing with. And I think I think, I think that was a, such a, a great thing for you guys to do. And I mean, was that something that you really did think about was, you know, want to send a message to those people as well who may be dealing with their own psychological um, issues? I would say that, you know, we don't set out to, to get on a soapbox and, and talk about one thing. And for us, it really does start from a place of character. It starts from a place of truth. You know, and I think just the same way that there are the incredible Lauren Ridloff is in the film and that leads to a rise in sign language lessons in class sign-ups. I mean, that's amazing. And it doesn't, we're not doing that because we want to, um, 
you know, send a message to the universe about this stuff. We really, we write the movie, you know, we write stories that we, for the world we want to see. And that's really what mm. the Eternals is a reflection of those characters. And so someone like Thena, you know, it's who her character is and the way that she combats us and, 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 and becomes stronger because of that, that is something that it, it's for sure a message, but I think that message is for you to interpret and for you to decide as an audience. And, and we're just yeah. trying to be truthful to who these characters are and, and, and why they're here in this, in this movie. Yeah, and you know, actually, it's funny that you should say that because it really makes me think, and I'm figuring this out in real time. Because, like Cass said, we don't go on a soapbox and set out to, to you know, uh, champion these causes or anything like that. But when you write something, you do put yourself into it. And and me personally, when I was a teenager, I really uh, suffered from really severe anxiety um, and like social anxiety. And so mm. going into situations um, uh, and meeting new people, those were that was very hard for me. And so there was a time in my life where I would never would have thought that I could ever um, write a movie like Eternals because that would have uh, required me to go and uh, and and meet all these new people and and and, t and test my anxiety. And so mm -hmm. so kind of my um, my defeating the Celestials or my um, my challenge, you know, was uh, was o was overcoming that and getting to this place in my career. And I think that mirrors uh, the journey for Thena uh, in the movie as well. And, and I think that's great that you guys didn't preach the messages out. Once again, they just kind of are experienced organically through the film. And I think that makes it more powerful because, once again, I think if you're, order, you're saying, preaching at someone, they tend to lock you out. But the way you, you present it in film, I think they're more able to um, absorb it. I, I assume you guys would agree on that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and I think another um, great part of the story, is, and I kind of want you guys to, th think, to discuss it a bit, is the idea of, I feel like one of the themes of the movie is the cost of life. That everything that exists exists through either the destruction or the devouring of something else. And it feels like that's a major plot point in, in the story or major idea. So can you kind of discuss how um, important that theme is to you and where that theme idea of the theme came from? For sure. I mean, I, I have to say this saying sometimes, which is like humanity can't help its scale. You know, when you walk down a forest path, you're crushing all kinds of life, life in the microbiome, uh, insects, plants, you know, this incredible, everything is living, you know, around us. And that sort of is the cost of existing. And it's something that you have to make peace with or certainly grapple with just as a human being. And so mm. for us, the film is a lot about loyalty, uh, your duty as a, as a soldier, your responsibility to your mission. And then the love for the people around you, your love for your family, and then sort of where do you fall on the spectrum when that's tested? So the movie is for sure a lot about faith. It's a lot about um, the cost of yeah moving forward the great human experiment. And I think that's that's something that we don't want necessarily. I think the film is pretty says it's pretty strongly that there isn't necessarily a right answer to that question, but there are costs. You know, mm. like if you're going to make these decisions, it's going to cost something. There's going to be consequences, but there isn't a solution to this problem you know like if you're going to it goes all the way back to the caveman you know in early mesopotamia like if you want to not starve to death you must kill fish you must kill beasts you must eat them and i think mm -hmm. that that's sort of we're taking that analogy to a cosmic scale which is to say you know maybe it's the trolley car problem for, on a galactic uh level which is like would would humanity die to save the lives of trillions, you know? And, and, mm -hmm. and that's a question that, you know, we put, we pose that in movies very often. It's almost the definition of heroism. It's Captain America. Would you sacrifice your life to save the lives of others? Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that, you know, the first, that's, that's why Cap is the way he is. He got on that plane, he flew it off into the Arctic and he thought he was gonna die. And he only survived by a miracle, but he was saving thousands, I don't know, maybe millions of lives. And so that's for sure the stuff that Eternals is playing with is these big cosmic questions for which I don't think that there is inherently a right answer, but they are mm. great questions. So um, obviously I got uh, time for one more question. So with, once again, without giving away any spoilers or giving away anything away, there's obviously two post credit scenes that give some idea where a potential directions for another movie could come from. Once again, don't, don't give away anything. Obviously you can't do that, but how much of what, the story could be next is already plotted out and planned out because obviously the movie is a big hit this guarantee i assume there's definitely gonna be a sequel um how much of it has already been planned and plotted and how much do you know going in what you wanted the next one to be well i am in my office and i have a window right there and i know that there is a marvel sniper just sitting across <laughs> the way just with a little headset waiting for my answer to this so i would have to say that um i'm 
I'm very happy to hear that everyone is eager to to know what the next chapter is, and you're just going to have to wait and see. <laughs> fair enough, totally fair enough, and I'm glad the sniper did not hit either one of you. <laughs> yeah, likewise, no, an expert answer. Look, we love this film. We really love the story, and we love these characters, and it's been an absolute honor to be a part of the story from the beginning. Um, and so, yeah, we would love to see more. We want to know where it goes next just as much as you, and we've certainly been thinking about it, but we're excited for you guys to see it uh, in a few years' time. Well, like I said, I definitely got to see it. Um, I loved it. My wife really loved it. Um, I'm hearing great things about it. So I want to thank you guys so much. Uh, Ryan, Kaz, uh, Furpo, you guys were fantastic. I want to thank you so much. I want to thank Marvel and uh, Ms. Grok for setting this up for me. And I look forward to seeing what you guys do next. Cheers, Thanks, Jeff. Jeff. We appreciate you. Thank you for the incredible interview. Thank you so much. Have a great